what you speak. May he decrease and you increase, oh God. Father, may you give him a portion of anointing for today, oh God. For the glory and honor of your holy name. I'm going to invite uh, Apostle Ukisa. You're very welcome. Let's, let's welcome him. Let's welcome him. Finally, the day has come. Come on, if you're clapping, clap. The guy is busy. Book him the next year. I said, okay, I will wait. And uh, lo and behold, uh, Mr. Claude, you know, called me and said, you know what? Uh, my friend is coming over. I'm like, hey, are you sure he's coming over? What is he coming to do? And he told me, he said, can I, can, you know, can we have a moment? And I said, I only need one hour of him. And uh, the one hour has become how many hours? And uh, we are very honored uh, to have you. Uh, Pastor Apostle Mukisa comes from us, to us from Uganda. done not only here but in other parts of Africa we've heard a lot about it and so it's a real delight to be here and uh, Pastor Ole thank you for having us and uh, Pastor Jeff thank you so much awesome yeah give honor where honor is due uh, we, we, we know that God works through people anytime God has wanted to do something Mostly, he has worked through people. How many of you here have ever seen an angel live? Everyone has denied. Okay. But how many have seen the hand of God work in your life? Yeah. And how many have seen God use people? Yeah, even our being here, God is using people to make it happen. So uh, that's why we are very intentional about honoring and uh, appreciating people because. Yeah, it, I think it's right. Now, uh, we are here because of our friend Claude Nikondeha, uh, who is, I, I don't know, it's, he's, it's very hard to introduce him in Burundi because he uh, is many things, but to us, he's a friend, he has been a mentor of mine for many years, and so, except for the COVID years, we almost came every year just to, to see what he's doing and the 
exponential increase of the same. Uh, and so that's why most of us came to just learn uh, how to do community transformation through business and how to take the gospel and make it tangible wherever we are. So thank you so much. Lord. Awesome. All right. Uh, my name is Moses Mukisa. We are going to use about 45 minutes conversing, and then you'll have about 15 to 20 minutes asking questions. So keep writing them down. At some point, you may need to remember something. And say, mm, wait a minute. What did you say? What's that? Repeat or go away, something, you know, depends on what's coming out. Is that okay? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to adjust to the space, so don't, uh, don't be too quiet. I'll, I'll start feeling like you're not understanding me, so you can make some noise, scratch your chair, do, do something, yeah. This is church. Church is a special... This is church, and it's a great honor to be here this evening. Now, we are here to talk about uh, financial growth, personal financial growth. I'll start by sharing the story. I studied architecture in school. I didn't study pastoring. I studied how to design buildings and all of that. And at the time I went to school in Uganda, architecture was one of the most competitive courses at the university. In fact, when I walked into my class the first day, we were about 25 of us, uh, six people out of those 25 people had been in the top 10 students in the country in their high school exams in our class. We had the highest concentration of academic uh, demagogues. <laughs> Uh, the whole university was in our class, and by the grace of God, I was one of those. Now, so, <laughs> so we get in and start studying five years of hectic work while the other people were going out to dance, disco, what, drinking. We didn't know any of that anyway because I was a Christian. But even those who were not, the, the work was enough to keep you on campus. Yeah, to keep you busy without <laughs> having room to go. So we did that five years, we finished, and then you are required to work under a registered architect for two years to get your certification as an architect. Then you can start your own business if you want. Now, because I was too much into ministry and uh, going around with a group doing evangelism, etc., I couldn't wait to get my certification so I could be my own boss. <laughs> yeah, because the whole thing of working in someone else's office where you have to report at this time, leave, it was holding me down, and I was all the rage into, you know, we have to go here, preach here, do that. So, and, uh, yes, architect. So, two years in, I got my certification, and I, I, off I went, doing my own uh, work, architecture work, I ran an office, and not a big office, but I did anyway. It was enough to, to sustain us financially with my family. And then, uh, so nine years into that journey, nine years after leaving university, by this time I'm a pastor. We are doing different things. We had a camp, a, a, a church camp. We were a small church back then. We would all go for camp, all of us, and would fit somewhere. So we had a camp, and uh, this, we invited one of the business leaders in our city called Patrick Mutaturi. So he came and, you know, he just stood there and gave a lecture. He, he didn't, like, preach and sweat and spit. He just, he just stood there and gave a one-hour lecture on money. By the time he was done, <laughs> I could see my life. <laughs> I could see that uh, that's the day I realized I had absolutely nothing, you know. With money. Now, <laughs> but for me, I had absolutely, 
nine years of work, absolutely nothing. Wow, someone wrote on Facebook and said, describe your finances using a Bible verse. So one guy wrote, in the beginning there was nothing. <laughs> oh gosh. And then someone, people wrote many things, but the winner was Jesus wept. <laughs> <laughs> like when Jesus looks at your money, <laughs> it's like Lazarus, you know. <laughs> Jesus wept. So I, mine was Jesus wept. Yeah, I'd been working nine years as an architect. Architects were on demand. I had work. I only had responsibilities. I had a wife and two kids. Nothing. And then it occurred to me that for the 18 years I'd gone to school, if you, re if you don't count the ones I repeated, the classes. <laughs> <laughs> for the 18 years I'd gone to school in Uganda, you study, at, for what I did, it had to be 18 years. Seven years of primary, I never went to nursery school. I'm sorry for the nursery people. <laughs> if you went, that makes it more than 20. <laughs> Seven years of primary, six years of secondary, five years of art school, 18 years. Not even a 10-minute lesson on money. Do you think that's by accident? Someone forgot. Look, they even taught us about, I don't know whether this they allow in Burundi, in church especially. They even taught us about sexual uh, reproductive health, you know. They're like, you're going to grow up, you'll find a girl, you'll feel like this, don't do this, do that, you know. Yeah, they anticipated that part. Who, 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 who was there? Yeah, they don't teach that stuff here. Over there, they brought plays and drama just to discourage us from touching. <laughs> yeah, but when it came to money, nothing, up zero, not even 10 minutes. No one thought one day these guys will graduate, they will go in the job market, they will make money. What do they do with it? Zero. Meanwhile, we knew about Mansa Musa in West Africa, Empire of Ghana. What do they teach here in, in Burundi? You know, the interesting... Sub eh? The King of Belgium. Uh, Shaka Zulu. Uh, Swiss Alps. Canadian Prairies. French Revolution. Napoleon Bonaparte. <laughs> Second World War. We knew all this stuff, but we don't know how to manage money. What a shock! So I looked at my wife. She looked at me and realized, you were broke. <laughs> you are so broke. If you don't change nothing, even your children will be broke. So we started, <coughs> who's writing a bridge? <laughs> so we started studying about money because we grew up in church. Okay, it wasn't there in school, but even in church. We grew up in church. My parents were very good Christians. They were teachers. My wife's parents were teachers at a higher level. They were professors. But we didn't know anything about money. Who here, you come from an educated background, but you don't know about money, by show of hands, you're like, I, I also didn't know. Oh, I'm the only one. Okay. So some of you, what I'm saying, you already know. Okay. So we start learning about money, reading all the things that we could get our hands onto, and we found out a few things. And when we found out these few things, we started sharing with other people. And 
making noise and telling people, don't continue the way you're going. Because we, we, we checked with our friends and realized that we were not the only ones who were working and had nothing. We like to joke among our friends that where you sat in class does not determine where you'll sit on the plane. Where you sat in class does not determine where you will sit on the aeroplane. Yeah. Sometimes you find the noisemakers who sit at the back and we are not paying attention. They are in business class. While they are ushering you to your seat back there next to the kitchen. All of this to say academic knowledge does not equal financial knowledge. There are two completely different fields of study. You can have broke doctors, broke accountants, broke managing directors. Huh? Broke, uh, don't talk about pastors. You want, us, you want them to remove their volume on the microphone. <laughs> yeah, you can have people who are very educated. Yeah, several degrees. They can give you a fever. But <laughs> broke. That was us. So we start trying to educate ourselves. We learned a few things. Started sharing them with people. Wrote a book. There's a book here. Straightforward Financial Growth. It's about personal finances. Then we started applying the same principles in our church, leading our church. Uh, or the church we lead, it's not really ours because you know people can say, the man they the own the church. No, please. And then we wrote another little book, Essential Practices for Healthy Church Finances. And then the business people picked it up and thought it was written for them, not church leaders. And so that's what we are here to share today. Amen. I've been informed that these books are available if you want to get yourself a copy. And I think they are going for, we decided to do a general f price, 20,000 francs for, for each. Yeah. yeah. This discounted. If you go out there, oh, you will not find it at that price. So you can get it today. Now, when it comes to personal finances, like all, because we have a few minutes, like all other fields of study, there is what we call the fundamentals. The fundamentals. Huh. I don't know what the football clubs in Burundi are. Uh, there is Kazoza Football Club. Are you sure? Bobanza FC. Okay, uh, uh, that's an imaginary one, but I'm sure it exists somewhere. Bobanza FC, and uh, what are the popular teams here? Which, 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 which league do you follow here? Ah, uh, no, no, no. Not, not the ones of here, like out, out there. Which, which, which leagues do people follow on TV? Premier League? Okay. I'm told Arsenal has recovered. I'm told they have found their their way around, around losing. <laughs> so you know that Bubanza and Arsenal, they are essentially playing the same game. It's just that the other guys have mastered the fundamentals to the level that they can be paid what they are paid to play. While these guys are playing, it's the same thing. Offside, penalties, throw-in, corner kick, what, taco, jago, name it. It's, you know, actually, it's the same thing. But if you take the other team and you put them against us, you know, you'll see, uh, you'll, you'll say it's not fair, but it's the same game. <laughs> so there are uh, things that we call fundamentals in personal finance. And you know, the thing about fundamentals is that most people know them. Like football, you, all of us here, we know the fun, okay, to the degree. You know, there's a ball and men who are running around as if they don't know what they're up to. The, yeah.
But when it comes to succeeding in it, you have to take those fundamentals and get really good with them. Practice them because I can come here and tell you wonderful things. You write notes and then you go and wait for the next seminar and it will not help you. What changed my life is I had one hour teaching and I decided to deal with it. I said, no, this can't continue. I'm going to change the story. And we've been, we've been at this journey with my wife. We, this started in 2011. For the last 20, 11 years, turning, trying to turn the dial from being broke people who only have debts. You know, one lady called Gloria Copeland said that some people live behind wheels, others live behind bills. Trying to turn the dial, and for the church as well, Claude has known us from the time we had nothing in the basement when he came and he had to take off his shoes to get in and that's, the ceiling was, you know, very close to the head. And by the grace of God, today we are building churches. We are building church buildings <laughs> worth millions of dollars of money that doesn't come from outside Uganda. Of money that's generated in the church because of the fundamentals. Now, I was promised that there is a flip chart or board or something. Could I draw? You know, here at CLM, you, when you say something, then you see something coming out. It's coming. Don't worry. So I want, I, I want to share with you the fundamentals, and they are easy. Uh, I hope we can make it memorable, and then you just go do something with it. Oh, I think I'm not there. What, what time did I start? <laughs> yeah, it's good. Yeah, these guys don't need to see. No, it's okay. <laughs> they, they know, I don't know whether they are practicing them. That's another thing altogether. So I'm going to take two approaches to it. Uh, the first approach is a general approach, which many people know about money. You get it. Okay. Yeah, that's fundamental one. Money does not have legs. Even if you're a Christian, even if you decided I'm going to come here and pray one hour a day until money comes, you'll be shocked at how it refuses. Someone said there are three ways to get money. You inherit it. You marry into it. Who succeeded with that one? <laughs> or you work for it. You work for it and you get it. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's more available, right? Legal, moral, ethical. Someone said money is a reward for solving problems. That's all. The Bible says in all labor there is profit. He says that the, 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 in all labor, all labor, there is profit. Even a child who is working hard in school is actually making profit. It's just that it's not coming at that point. It's probably going to come 10 years or 20 years later. But there is profit in that labor than a child who quits school. Am I making sense? It says that the soul of the diligent will be made rich. The soul of the diligent. You see, one of the mistakes we made is we made, we handed over the money to the devil. We said, money belongs to the devil in church. That's generally the song I hear out there. It's not here in Burundi, but where I come from, people even have accused people who have some money. They say, they went underwater, under the sea. That's where, to the devil. They are Illuminati. That's how they got the money. In other words, they are saying, if you want to get rich, don't work with God and his principles. Work with the devil. 
Can you imagine anyone who thinks that the devil has more money than God? I don't know what Bible they are reading. Wow. Shock to the system. The Bible teaches that the love of money is the root of all evil. Love. Now, you don't have to have a lot to love it. In fact, the last time I checked, dot, dot, dot. I'll not even finish that sentence. But I've found people who don't have money, a lot of money, who are in love with money. And I've found people who have a lot of resources who are not in love with those resources. How do you tell? By their level of generosity. So, let's first get rid of the idea that the devil is better to go with if you are going to make money than God. Abraham was a businessman. The people God called in the Bible, they, they were not broke people. If you are, you, ever, you can check. Yeah, right? Adam and Eve, they had their whole place to themselves. You don't see in Genesis that, and then they were hungry. And they asked the Lord, Lord, why hast thou put us thither in this garden? And he saith unto them, Behold, it is mine will for thee to be hungry and broke. Keep going. No. You see in the word that every time God moved, there was abundance. And every time the devil moved, there was scarcity. In the Garden of Eden, there was abundance until Eve started talking to a snake. And just for, for purposes of clarity, if you, if you find a snake and it talks, <laughs> don't talk back. <laughs> you get the idea? God calls Abraham, there is abundance. Isaac, abundance. Jacob, abundance. Joseph goes to Egypt, creates abundance. Solomon, David, all of those people. You know, do you know when Israel was always in trouble? When, when they had scarcity is when they abandoned God and started worshipping other gods. Do you know that? In, uh, I just want to tell you this. Now, if you want to be broke properly, participate in witchcraft. Yeah, I've never participated in witchcraft, but I've observed. Yeah. Do you know that the official religion of a country called Haiti is voodoo, witchcraft? It is one hour flight from America. But the level of poverty... Now, the Nigerian said, if Nigeria was where Haiti is located, <laughs> they'll probably have dug a tunnel by now. <laughs> Are you getting the point? Let's talk about Jesus. And he came unto that city, and behold, they were hungry. And he saith unto them, Lo, I have no food, for we are all going to be hungry. For the Son of Man doth not know how to create abundance. Let us fast. And they fasted. You know, everywhere Jesus went, he created abundance. Even in the, out there when he was teaching in the wilderness for like three days and they didn't have anything, he still created abundance. If you are a person who walks with Jesus, you are walking around with someone who specializes in creating abundance. Are we understanding? Paul wrote to the Thessalonians and told them that they should mind their own business, their own. You know, we are in the business of minding other people's business. You talk to anyone here about Elon Musk, they will tell you everything about Elon Musk until you ask them, what's your net worth? They know Bill Gates' net worth and income is, but they don't know theirs. What a shock. So he said, mind your own business and work with your own hands. It says that you may walk 
properly toward those who are outside. When was the last time people thought church is the place where I can find a person to do business with and it will go well? We can change that story. We should change that story. It's up to you and I to change that story. Why are people preferring not to work with people in church? Because we don't mind business. Mind your own, I mean, get your mind and insert it into your business. Yes, that we may walk properly toward those who are saying, and says that you may lack nothing. Wow. Paul, the apostle, has that vision that you can get to a place where you don't lack anything. Why? So that we can be able to help other people. When you are the one the landlord is chasing, you can't help others. You, it's very hard to think about paying someone else's rent when the landlord is chasing you. And I'm telling you, I've ever had three months. I've ever stayed somewhere where I was four months in rent areas. Yeah, that was my former, you know, financial blueprint. Four months in rent areas. Not because I didn't want to pay. I just didn't know what to do. I couldn't pay rent. Ah, uh, yeah. But you can get to a place where you can do something about it. You go from rent areas to being on time, to being ahead, to paying for someone else, then to building your house, and then thinking about other people's accommodation. Amen. I know it can sound all too lofty, but if you start, you will get there. Amen. So you get it. How? You solve problems. There's something we like to, to do in, in, when we do this as a longer seminar. We like people to come up with their value for the minute. Sunday at Elijah is a pastor in Ukraine. He said that Rich people convert their time to tangible products and services. Time conversion. What's your conversion ratio? How much is your minute worth? If you ever get the time, you work out your income for the month and divide by days, divide by hours you work, and divide by minutes. And then... Since you want to be international, put it in an, an international currency. You'll see the small points that you've never seen before. <laughs> I want one in advance. You need to take a strong cup of coffee before you do that exercise. So the first thing you do is get it. Get the money. Go solve a problem. Be your own boss. Don't walk around with papers looking for a job. They no longer exist. I'm sure by now you know. Jobs don't exist, but problems exist. And money is a reward for solving problems. The more problems you solve, the more money you get. It's as simple as that. It's as simple as that. You sell one book, you make 20,000. You sell 1,000 books, you make 20 million. Yeah. Is that too hard to think about? Yeah. It's as simple as that. Once I figured that out, I said, I'm not going to be broke again. Yeah. I've worked with many people about this thing. One time I was working with a couple. They are known to many of us. I have to keep converting to francs. Eh? And, but between them, they were making about 600,000 francs a month, the two. And as you can imagine, most of the problems in their marriage were related with money. They got into our program. We worked with them for about six months, seven months. And after about six months, they were making about six million francs a month. Yeah. 
I tell you this story, just to tell you, don't, don't think that the money you make today, that's all the money there is to make. One of our pastors, when we were working, again, when we had started the coaching program, we set ourselves a target and said, you can't make less than 100 million shillings, which is about, about 40, about 60 million, about 60 million francs a year. So I asked her, write down your income streams, and it all came to about 15 million, or less, about 15 million francs. And then I told her, beautiful, 15 million francs, that's nice. Now, if you're going to stay around and get into this program and become a coach, I need 60 million. By the end of the year, she had made 60 million. In other words, she, she had all these capacities that she didn't know about. And that's the same with you. You're probably just clocking in to get paid, clocking out, and enjoying the weekend. Can you imagine the whole weekend, unproductive? Even in the Bible, they say we should work six days, not five. Not five, six days. At least use that sixth day when you don't go to work to do something, generate something, start something. There are many problems around. Anyway, get it. Second is guard it. Guard or protect it. Okay? Why? Because money is ready to take a walk from whoever does not protect it. Yeah, someone said, money talks. It always says bye to me. And then he said, at least for you, it talks to you. He says, for me, it weighs from a distance. When it's coming like this, it just waves and goes. Those of you, your, your salary is about a million francs, but you have car loan, I don't know what, all these expense things. So the, the money, when it's coming to your account, <laughs> deductions, eh? Do you do deductions in Burundi? Yeah. It's just off. If you are to ever touch it, you have to connive with the bank manager to say, block any... <laughs> Make sure you, you don't re reroute my money. I want to come with an ATM and get something. Because it will just go. Wow. <laughs> now, the way, the way I like to put it, have you ever put a saucepan on fire and then, but there's nothing in it, no water, then the saucepan gets hot. And then you get some water, little, and you pour in the pan, what happens? Yeah, that's how some of us, our, our money works. You have this one income source from your job. Then you have car loan, this loan, rent, what? Now, the, the, the income is about a million or two, but the expense is about 1.98. So when that money lands on the account, it's already hot. <laughs> you go, Shh. And before you know it, all you see is vapor. Vapor. It's gone. Wow. What a life. Now, that was us. My wife and I, that's how we lived. The money spoke or waved. At a distance. It never settled in our account. You have to guard it. And you know what? You need to have, can I give you a, a simple formula? 
No grain. He said, go to Joseph. Joseph said, bring the money. We, you, we sold, you sold, we, we bought the grain, you took the money. Bring money. So the Bible says they brought the money and Pharaoh owned all the money. And for one year, they ate from the money. In economics, it's called liquid assets. Liquid assets, cash. One year passed, the grain, the, they needed more grain. They went back to Joseph. The money is finished. What are we going to do? He said, bring the cattle. They brought all the cattle. The Bible says Pharaoh owned all the cattle in Egypt. Those are movable assets. You know when you hit hard times, that flat screen is gone. <laughs> One chair is gone. All those extra cars you use back in your compound, gone, gone, gone. Oh yeah, sabufa, gone. I don't know what things people like to buy in Burundi which they don't use. Yeah, it fridge is essential. <laughs> so, then they ate, then it got finished. What? Shock of shocks, it got finished. So they came back and said, um, the money is finished, we need more grain. He said, bring the land. Fixed assets. Real estate is the last frontier for fighting in economics. Once you start losing your land, you're done. My Burundian friends, go buy land. They no longer make it. Yeah, they no longer make it. Do what you can, whatever you can. Combine, get into a group, ten of you, buy one plot at a time. Do everything you can to buy land. I'm telling you. So they gave all the land to Pharaoh. Now Pharaoh was the number one landlord. Now they don't have money. They don't have cattle. They don't have land. So they ate and finished. Then they came back and said, we will not hide it from my Lord that even the, we are still hungry. I said, but now you don't have land. You don't have cattle. You don't have money. What, do you, what are you going to offer? They said, take we, our bodies. We are ready to work for Pharaoh. That's reverse economics. It's like you're going back into employment in, in your 80s. Labor. So they offer their bodies and said, okay, now this is how it's going to work. Till the land, take care of the cattle, eat it, see. Eat whatever, but 20% must go to Pharaoh. That's the beginning of taxation. 20% to Pharaoh. And remember, you are just on Pharaoh's property. And he moved them into cities. Now, watch this. The cattle they are taking care of belongs to who? To Pharaoh. But whose cattle was it before? Theirs. The land on which the cattle is grazing belongs to Pharaoh. But whose land was it before? Theirs. The money they are using to run the business belongs to Pharaoh. But whose money was it before? Theirs. The difference is Pharaoh collected 20% and they didn't guard it. In my country, I find that there are many people who want to live up to 100. But by around, when they retire at 60, by 63, the money is finished. So they have to go to heaven. Yeah. Something comes up. Some things some sickness, some, something. And they have to go there because the money to keep you around is finished. They are stressed. They are there. They have their children. Can you imagine having to call your... So many of you, you have young children. Now imagine later on, you're calling them and saying, huh, uh, my daughter, we, uh, we need tea leaves. Ah!
guy came and promised to get me a car. How many of you know you should not use your savings to buy a car because a car is not an asset? So I gave the guy the money and we never saw the car. So we had to start from scratch. We started again from 10. Then when we discovered 20 is what might save you, we went to 20. Now we probably do 50% of our income. Our, our vision with my wife is to get to a point where we are tithing 10%. We are giving 10%. We are living on 10% and reinvesting 70%. Yeah, that's what we want to get to. We are at a stage where we are reinvesting maybe about 50%. But we, can, we know that over time we'll be able to go to that percentage. Oh, yes. The, you are, but, but it's about being consistent, consistent, consistent. Doing that little thing. Banking that little money, sitting down on your computer and entering the figures every week without fail. It just won't come to you. Give it. I like to say 20% because if you're Christian, I'm assuming that you know that you need to give 10% to church for the work of the ministry. Now, the 10%, my understanding, it's not even yours. You're returning it to the owner. Yeah, it's not yours. In case you thought it's yours, it's not yours. Yeah, you have a business partner called God who gives all the oxygen, all the ideas, all the relationships and the blood flowing without you paying anything. Yeah, you don't need uh, <laughs> to insert extra things to make it work. And he says, you know what? Let, I love you and I probably should be taking 70%, but only give me 10. 10. 10 will do for me. 10 will do for me to help build churches. They will go out, do evangelism, uh, do social work among the people. Just 10. And then say, 90 is yours. And they're like, oh, God, are you sure you want to give me all of 90? Say, no, 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 please. 90 is yours. And then what do you do? You, get your, you manage to get yourself into some little crisis. And you come back to God and say, you know what, God, I, I know you are, you are taking only 10, eh? but I also want it. <laughs> How many of you would want to do business with anyone who is like that? You give the guy 90, now even your 10, he wants it. What a shock. Because he was always tithing and I never used to tithe. But there was one problem. Patty bought all my snacks. Every time, he literally funded my life at campus apart from the things the government provided. And one day it hit me. The person you're arguing with is the one who funds your life. That's when I started tithing. So I hope you don't have any struggles with tithing. Because you have another 90% to do many other things with. So what we decided to do with my wife, right from when we made this decision, we said, tithe belongs to God. Put it aside. But we are human beings. We are pastors. We are Africans. Friends. If you don't have a budget, oh. So we started setting aside 10% just to give and participate in generosity. And it has helped us to give. But we also know the boundaries. Yeah, because one of these days, someone will come and say, lend me a million fr frank, uh, francs. I need it right now. Right now as I talk, the moon, the sun, and the earth are on a collision course. They are moving towards each other. And if you don't give me a million francs right now, I tell you, we are all going to perish. And just lend it to me. I will pay you back. Don't put up your hands back. How many people have never been paid back? And you lost both the money. So that's when you say, hey, 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 hey. I understand. Now, here is 50,000 francs. 
you don't have to pay it back. Use it to buy airtime and fuel to find a fool who will lend you a million francs. A set amount already, you know within which limits to give and how not to go outside of those boundaries. Am I making sense? So get it, guard it, grow it, give it. Questions? Do I pass an, an offering box for that one? <laughs> All right. If you have any questions, I have uh, we have two microphones over here. Thank you very much for your question. There's a hand over there. There's another. Moses, I see you. I'll start with the lady over there. All right. Straight to the point. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll take them as they come. All right. I, Can I we take another one or we'll just... just okay, okay. I, I thought maybe we could take No, no, couple. just go on. Just go on. Because All right. The thought has to be very... Uh, uh, I mean, the whole rage about prosperity, prosperity gospel, ETC, I think is a distraction, personally. I think it's a distraction. Yeah. Uh, it's... I feel like it's a distraction. Just ignore it. There are people who are going to abuse any system, including church. And they tell you, bring all the money here, and after you leave it here, when you get home, you'll find it in your bedroom. Please, don't, don't, let's, yeah. uh, let's use some brains, okay? That's, that's not going to happen. Yeah. So please, forget that version. It doesn't work like that. Okay. Now, having said that, what we've done is throw out the baby with the bathwater. We said this whole thing of people promising people air is too much, so now let's forget it. Let's just embrace almost poverty. Almost like just have barely and barely making it gospel. Now, the danger with that version is that you'll never be able to help anyone. Yeah, the only person you're able to help is you if you embrace that version. So you must have an abundance mindset. Yeah. Something in what the prosperity preachers are saying is correct apart from the application. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of what they are saying is true. That actually, if you work with God, like other people have worked with God, and you are in a normal environment, you can be working with God in a difficult situation, in a country where things don't work. But if you are in a normal environment, there is peace. I know you've had some difficulties, like in this country where you can't run a business because there is all this fighting going on. But in a normal environment, it, you should be able to think, I'm going to create enough prosperity. The word prosperity is not a bad word, actually, if you look it up. Enough abundance to help not only myself, but many other people. And you'll discover that doesn't work by you bringing all the money into the basket and walking home. You don't even have transport and hoping that you'll find it in your bedroom or in your ceiling. It doesn't work. So let's think. The, the Bible teaches about how to do that. It's what I've just been teaching you. Work, save, invest, give. So... I hope, I hope that clarifies. Yes, uh, Moses, hopefully you've uh, been answered for more clarification by the book as well. Yeah, th that's 10% on that stuff. <laughs> you mean... <laughs> Moses, I'm 
Moses. Grow it, yeah. Annual, annual. Yeah, if anyone tells you they can do 20% monthly, like they run this whole thing on a computer where there are graphs and what, please run away and save your money. <laughs> there is nothing like that. That, that, that. Yeah, I know there are so many stories out there. Forex trading, crypto this, crypto that. Just please don't. There's, there's a voice of it. Hello, brother. I'm grateful for what you've given us. Actually, we've learned a lot, me personally. At this age, actually, I'm just learning financial breakthrough and something of that nature. Mm. Throughout school, I never had anything to do with that. My question is with number four, give it. Yes. I know it's good to give. It's very important. Even the Bible tells us it's good to give than to receive. You, are, you get blessed. But... Is untrue teaching these people we give to be lazy. Why don't we use the principle of the uh, of Pharaoh of making them work for it after losing everything they had? <coughs> they lost money, they lost land, movable assets, and they remained with only their labor. Why don't we make them work a little for it so that they learn to make money? Thank you. Hey, that's a tough one, eh? Uh, if, if uh, you know, the, one of the easiest ways to express love is to give. If you, if you make money and you don't give it, it's, it's going to corrode your heart. In fact, the, what, the be biggest benefit to giving is not even the receiver. It's the giver. Yeah, money can corrode your, it can spoil your soul and you become something else if you are not always giving. I see one more question over there. Over there. Okay. Roadmap, what should they start with to deal with that? Thank you for that question. Uh, debt is a complicated subject. Uh, in Uganda, most people try to solve that by switching off their phone <laughs> and going to South Sudan. Now, <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure that's going to work for you. <laughs> but I've worked with a few of my friends who were deep in debt and I've helped them cut their debt down by 50, 60, 70, 80 percent. It's about consistency. Write down all your debts. And then every week, people say they don't make money weekly. It's a lie. If you spend money daily, you literally make money daily. Every week, 
prepare something. Dave Ramsey advises that you start with the smallest one so because you're trying to create momentum against the debt. Every week, pay something. However little, pay something weekly. And I tell you, in, that debt will be gone in no time. I've seen people go from mountains of debt to almost nothing or what they can manage. Because the problem with debt, it's also that the interest is, cor is literally eating away your wealth. So, yeah, if you can also shift some debt. You may have got some bad debt with very high interest rates from certain sources, and maybe you need to figure out how to get friendlier debt and cut it off because of interest. Also, go to your creditors and negotiate and ask them, can we pause the interest? Because the thing is killing me. You can say, we are both going to lose. I'll never be able to pay it. And if, if you take me to prison, even worse, I'll never be able to pay it. <laughs> so, yeah, you, you should know that the person who lent you the money, also it's to their advantage if you work out a solution. And then you make a commitment and you take it down weekly. Weekly, weekly, weekly. And then when you're done, never get into personal debt again. Yeah. All right. I see one more man over there. My question is a little bit in contradiction with her question. Yeah. Uh, you talked about getting it. Getting it, based on what you explained, it's working. Now, what about these institutions that lend out money? Mm. How do you advise people to get it from the financial institutions and grow it? Thank you. Mm. That, that, that sounds straightforward, but it's not so straightforward. So, uh, if you go, say, to Kazoza, they may help you to say, if you do this the right way. So, first of all, I tell people, I, I don't think it's good to get in debt to start a business. Because you haven't proved that it works. Yeah, just at a practical level. But if you've proved that it works, and maybe you need to scale it up, and you know that these are the numbers, and you factor in the risk factor, they never tell you that in the bank, that the interest rate is 15%, the risk factor rate is 10%, so really it is 25%. Because you don't calculate that, you're assuming that things will always be the way they are, COVID will never come, nothing will... You know, the lorry will never get a puncture. The driver will never drink. You know, all of that is in there. If you calculate that and add it on the interest rate, it's crazy. So you, what I'm saying is you have to be careful about how you go about debt, business debt. Be careful. Um, yeah. And as much as possible, Avoid it. What should you do if you're running a business? This is what I tell people the whole time. They ignore me, but those who have listened to me, it has worked for them. Use the same, some of these same things. In a business, you, I advise people that get part of your gross profit, gross profit, and save 20% of it to invest it in assets for the business. If you're running a church, you, you barely... You, you are not putting out products, so you don't have uh, product expenses, supplier expenses. So just get 20% of the income, set it aside to invest in assets for the church. The Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints, also known as the Mormons, who most of us think they have a problem with their theology because they added the whole book. What a shock. They have assets worth more than $100 billion. One of the richest organizations in the world. Do you know how they've done it? They've taken the tithe and the offering. They set up a company that just does investments. What is it called? I'm remember forgetting the name of the Insight Advisory. Insight Advisory. They have like one, almost $1.5 billion in Microsoft. One, uh -uh. Yeah, $1.2 billion in Apple. 
like almost a billion in Google. They, these guys, they, they are entrenched. That's why they can afford to send people out to any part of the world and they can buy land anywhere they want. And 100 years ago, they were bankrupt. Then they decided to use this wisdom. So whether it's a business, an organization, whatever it is, the principle applies. What we've done at Worship Harvest from when we learned about it, we've been putting aside 20% of all the income to invest it in the assets of the church. And now we are, it's growing and we are going, going somewhere. So that's the longer term view, I think. I think that one of the dangers of debt is you get it, you succeed, and you think, hmm, it worked. You go for bigger, you succeed. You go for bigger, you succeed. You go for bigger, you succeed wildly, and then one day, one day, it's not that you can't pay back. It's just that once that's your system, you'll always go back for more. Then one day, this one venture doesn't work out. I've seen people who were flying like that, crash to the ground, because one day, they took that one loan, which went south. And they had to liquidate and sell very valuable assets. Not to, 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 to just keep going. So that, that's the, I feel like that's the temptation. The temptation is the ease with which you can keep getting bigger and bigger debt and bigger debt and bigger debt. And then one day you, you, you hit something that you can't go over. Yeah. See a question over there. Thank you very much for coming to us, and we are so grateful for these teachings. But along the way, you said that there is no job uh, available anywhere, and we, we can agree, all of us. But uh, we have uh, high rates of joblessness in Burundi, and the high rates of young men and women, uh, young ladies that are coming from school, they are graduates, and they are jobless. But when we try to, to get something to do, uh, there is no way available. And many, uh, they are hiding under ministry umbrella and were confused to know who is called and not called. What are the advices you can give these people that are running away from responsibility as far as money is concerned? Thank you very much. Hey, hey, hey. Where, where is the exit? <laughs> I need to be sure that I can get out safely. Full-time ministry, uh, I think that uh, my understanding of the, New, of the New Testament is that we are all priests and kings, and that, let's say if you start, for, for the longest time, I didn't take a salary from the church because it was so small, we would have died of hunger. <laughs> so I did my architecture work while supporting the church. And at some point, we had enough money to get a staff member that wasn't me. We hired an administrator who had to keep running the church 100% while I did part-time and I did my architecture work. And then at some point, architecture work is so engaging, I could no longer keep up. So I shifted to leadership training with the John Maxwell team and writing books and doing everything in the world to make some money to support the church. It was much, much later that I started getting a salary when the church could afford it. So, what I say, don't, don't hide there. It's not going to help you. Because church is a public institution. And you can't grow a church if, you know, like if a church is there, there are people, it has structures, there is tithe and what. You can do that and say, you know, some people need to give all the time because of this. But if you have 13 members and you have four staff members and the 13, the four are part of the 13 members, <coughs> I'm not sure that you're going to survive. So, I don't know. I don't, th I, I don't know whether people just willing do, willingly do it. Sometimes maybe just out of despair, you're like, look, I've tried everything. I can't see. Let's go pray and preach and do evangelism. Yeah, but in some cases, I, I will not discount the fact that sometimes God is going to clearly tell a person, 
this is what I want you to do. And when God speaks to a person, we were not there, we don't know. How do we tell you spoke to them? Over time, it will show. Yeah, but we can't judge at that point. We have to trust them on their word. So, but in case someone genuinely wants to find out and they thought that once God calls you to the ministry, it means throwing everything aside, I don't believe that's true. Uh, for many of us, we had to work for many years while supporting the ministry. That's what Paul did, remember? Yeah, but it's not always going to be like that. But if anyone is here and you genuinely don't know what to do, you think God has called you and you think it means you should quit your job, close your business, get a Bible and stand on the corner and preach, maybe that's not how it is. Maybe that's not how it is in the scriptures. Yeah. I think we have one more and okay. then we can call it a night because we said we're going to finish at eight. Um, and we know there are a few challenges with the buses and all those things. Are we okay with that? All right. Good morning, everyone. Good, after, uh, good evening, sir. Good evening, sorry. Yeah. And then uh, my question is like, sometimes you might sacrifice just to get that money. And you also pray for that and for our businesses. But at a certain point, we're going to be like, and uh, according also to these morning sessions, the pastor was like, we don't pray for what we want, but we pray to get what God wants for us. And then there is a, a, a certain point, we just like, you can pray for your businesses in order to grow your businesses or things like that. But how can we see that the business that God wants us to invest? Because at a certain point, we're going to be like, I have this, best, this business. And you're going to be like, God, I pray for this, mess, this business. I want this business to grow, things like that. But at a certain point, they, they're also like pastors who are going to be like, just you, are, you, are, you, are, you want to give help to God. But that business, like you don't, you, you have to, you don't have to help God. God can, can't be helped. So how can we pray or how can we see that that business is what God wants us to invest? Thank you. All right. I hope I understood it. Let me give you an answer that maybe covers many bases. If you ever do anything, yeah, anything, whether it's a business, whether it's a non-profit organization, whether it's to go and start a ministry, or I don't know, whatever it is, if you ever do anything and you want it to be godly and great, never make it about you. Never make it about you. It's always about others. It's always about others. Take that word and run with it the rest of your life. The word others. Let it always ring in your head. You'll never fail. The people who fail are the ones who think it's about them. When it's about others, and you're thinking, if I'm running a business that could employ 50 people, why should I not run it well and I end up employing five people? How much good will you do employing five people versus 50 people? Then you're going to pray and say, God, give us opportunity because I want to employ 50 people. Maybe your business supplies something that people are in need of. You know, uh, Daniel Lapin is a Jewish uh, rabbi. He said something in one of his books that intrigued me. He said that Bill Gates has done more good through Microsoft than through the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is the vehicle they used to give away the money. And they have so much money, they employ more than a thousand people to try and give it away. So help me, God. Now, it's very easy to look at that and say, oh, that's such a good thing. Look how many people they are helping. But how many people have they helped through Microsoft? How many people, where would we be without Microsoft? Yeah. As a human race. So you see that, <laughs> I hope I'm not disturbing anyone's theological senses right now. But you see that having this product, even though they are charging money for it, that has helped billions of people run their businesses and be able to use a computer, 
has done a lot more good and produced a lot more value than the charity. So, I, you should always think like that. What? Because, you know, we think that business is about making money. No, it's not. If it was about making money, you go get a job, you get enough to take care of yourself. It is very difficult to succeed in business. I'm telling you. It's not a walk in the park. Business people, you talk to them. They don't sleep. They work. It's so hard. You wonder, why would anyone put themselves through this? It's because they want to try and get certain things into the community. You find that there are products you can't find here in this city. You look for them, you can't find them. And you know what? It's all looking, waiting for a business person to say, I will get this product from wherever it is made or whatever. I will set up thing here and supply my city with this product because there are people who need it. Once you're doing that, you're not going to be asking whether should I succeed or not. Because it's all about others. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, for having us. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you.